This is the 2021 Mercedes E-Class, and it's the best E-Class ever. I have owned three Mercedes E-Classes myself, and I am seriously impressed by this car. And today I'm going to review it and explain why. Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bids, which is my enthusiast car auction website for cool cars from the modern era. We've sold some amazing cars recently on Cars and Bids, including this Land Rover Discovery Camel Trophy Participant Vehicle, which sold for $90,000. This beautiful 1986 Porsche 911 Turbo, which sold for $65,000. And this gorgeous Bentley Arnage T, which sold for $42,500. If you're looking to sell your cool car from the modern era, the 1980s and up, Cars and Bids is the place to do it. You'll get the most interest and the most views with your cool car. And if you're looking to buy a cool car from the modern era, we have daily auctions with amazing selection. Check it out at carsandbids.com. But back to the E-Class. The current E-Class came out for the 2017 model year, but it's been heavily updated for 2021 with some new styling and some new technology. Now, Mercedes offers the E-Class as a sedan, a wagon, a coupe, or a convertible. So there's really something for everyone. And for 2021, the wagon version, this car, now comes standard with all-wheel drive, and it's been lifted up a little bit, and they call it the all-terrain in order to try to appeal to more or SUV shoppers. The E-Class also comes with a wide variety of powertrain options. There's the base E350 with about 250 horsepower. Then there's the E450, which is this car, 360 horsepower. Then there's the AMG E53 with 430 horsepower. Then there's the AMG E63 with over 600 horsepower. Pricing also spans a wide range of base level sedan starts around $55,000, but it can stretch to well over $110,000 for a well-equipped AMG E63. And it's an excellent car. I'm reviewing the wagon, the new E450 all-terrain, but a lot of what I'm talking about applies to all the E-Class models. So today I'm going to review this car. First, I will take you on a tour of it and show you all the quirks and features of the new E-Class. Then I'll get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the new E-Class up front. I want to start with technology because that's one of the things that makes this car so great. This has the latest version of MBUX, Mercedes infotainment system, and it works great. There are many great things about it. One is how controllable it is. You can use it as a touchscreen, as you can see I'm doing right now, and it's very responsive, very intuitive, responds right to your touch. Or if you don't want a touchscreen, you can use it with the control in the center. This little control pad lets you scroll around the screen and click on whatever you want. There's even a home button and a back button built into the pad, which makes it easier to navigate. Or if you want to operate it even more conveniently while you're driving, you can use these controls on the steering wheel. You can see you can use them to scroll through left, right. You can click on stuff. And again, you have a home button and a back button to make navigating easier. And I love this about MBUX. It can be used however is more convenient to you. You're not committed to any one thing. So if you don't like touchscreens, you don't have to use it like one. And if you prefer touchscreens, you can use that too. It's a really great idea to have all these redundant controls. And back to the steering wheel. This is a brand new steering wheel from Mercedes-Benz. I think this might be the first Mercedes that it's in, and it has some different controls from prior Mercedes steering wheels. You can see over on the right, there's more touch-sensitive controls rather than traditional buttons. For instance, the volume control is just this little slider, and you slide your finger up or down to raise or lower the volume, which is pretty easy to use. Now, over on the left, these controls are just as interesting. These will adjust your car's adaptive cruise control settings, and the slider here will change your cruise control speed. If you go up or down, it just adjusts the speed a little bit, or you can tap it up or down for a larger adjustment. And speaking of this car's adaptive cruise control, let's talk about its self-driving system, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Two huge things that it can do for you. For one, you're driving along, especially on the highway, it can steer for you, it can brake, it can accelerate. A lot of luxury cars have that, but this system allows you to be hands off the wheel for up to 45 seconds. 
since I timed it. You can have your hands completely off the wheel for almost a minute. That makes this one of the longest hands off the wheel systems in the entire car business. And when it finally comes time to let the car know you're there by putting your hand back on the wheel, you don't have to like shake the wheel like in most cars. Instead, the steering wheel is touch sensitive. So if you just rest your hand or your thumb on the steering wheel, it will know that you're touching it. So you don't have to do that stupid, hey, I'm here, I'm shaking the wheel thing, which is kind of annoying. Also cool with this system, it can make full lane changes. So you're driving along with the self-driving system activated, you want to change lanes, just put on the turn signal and it will make the lane change for you and then complete the lane change and you turn the signal off and you're done. That's pretty cool. And frankly, using this system, I see no advantage to Tesla Autopilot over this. I think the systems are just as good. If not, frankly, this is a little better because of that touch sensitive steering wheel. You don't have to like shake the wheel. It's a great automated driving system in this car. But anyway, speaking of technology, let's go back into these screens to go over some of the wonderful quirks and features of MBUX. Now, for one thing, I just love MBUX, not only because of the different ways you can control it, but it's just so easy to use and so easy to control. You can see the home screen laid out here with all the items that you want. And there's also some little icons below each main icon on the home screen that give you shortcuts to stuff that you're going to be using most frequently. It is fantastic, but it does have some really cool quirks and features. One is augmented reality navigation. A few cars are just starting to offer this, and it's a feature that uses the camera system to show you where you're going when navigation is active. So you set a destination, you're driving along, and it will actually show you using the camera where you're supposed to be turning. So you come up to your next turn and it is showing you with arrows on like the screen of where you are, what street you're supposed to be turning on. So instead of looking at a map and it's kind of confusing, you know, is it this one? Is it the next one? This thing shows you quite clearly it's this one. And here is an image of what you're seeing and exactly where you have to turn. That is an amazing piece of technology. And this car also features a voice control system that's pretty advanced more than most other cars. To wake it up, you simply say, hey, Mercedes, and then tell it what you want it to do. For example, hey, Mercedes, I'm cold. I'm increasing the temperature to 73 degrees. Or you can be a little bit more specific with your request like this. Hey, Mercedes, turn the temperature to 63 degrees. I'm setting the temperature to 63 degrees. With that said, I've noticed this system, Mercedes calls it Linguatronic, it's not perfect. When I tried to make a call using my contacts list, it couldn't find the right person in my contacts. It's not great, none of these voice control systems are perfect, but this one is pretty good. And by the way, speaking of the climate controls and the temperature, this car has a wonderful quirk that works alongside the climate controls, and that would be the fragrance. Inside the glove box, there is a fragrance canister. <laughs> And when you turn on the air freshener feature in the climate control, you can see you can adjust the amount of air freshener and it will send out the fragrance through the climate control vents as it blows out your climate control air and that will change the scent inside the cabin. This particular scent is called Free Side Mood. I have literally no idea what that could mean, but apparently when this canister finishes, you can go to a Mercedes-Benz deal and replace one or order replacements online and then just put in a new canister with a new smell whenever you want. That's pretty cool. And our next interesting quirk in MBUX is the seat comfort, because with this car, you can turn on a massaging seat and not just any massage. You can choose between all of these types of massage, including hot, relaxing shoulder massage and a hot, relaxing back massage, which uses both the massager and the heated seat. It's so stupid. How could anybody want to massage this high quality when they're driving down the road? But this has it. Heated seat and massage on at the same time for your perfect massage experience. And as if that wasn't crazy enough, this car also offers a workout while you're driving. This active workout feature gives you the opportunity to stretch your muscles, kind of pushing them against different pressure points in the seat. And that way, if you're on a long drive, your muscles are starting to tighten up, you can still work out to this program that the car offers to make sure you stay at least least relatively loose. That's actually a pretty neat idea and kind of impressive. And next up, another wonderful quirk of this system comes with the ambient lighting in this car. Now you can change the color of the ambient lighting, but that's not really surprising anymore. A lot of cars let you do that. The cool thing in here is you can have the color change while you drive along. You don't have to select just one color. You can select a multicolor and then it will go from red to blue to purple to green as you're driving down the street. And I must say, I've been driving it at night with that and I think it is wonderful 
beautiful. I love to see those colors change. The other cool thing here is you can link the ambient lighting to your climate control inputs. So when you make the climate control temperature colder, the ambient lighting briefly turns blue to confirm that you just went for a colder temperature. You make the climate control warmer and the ambient lighting briefly turns red to confirm that you've gone for a warmer temperature. And that is just a wonderfully cool little quirk of the ambient lighting system. <laughs> and by the way, one other quirk of the climate control system, this car offers heated seats, obviously, and cooled seats, but it also has heated panels. You can set it here so the heated panels go on with the heated seats and then like your center console panel is heated and your door panel. So when you're sitting here in the car with your arms resting on the panels, they too will be heated, not just your back and your butt. That's pretty cool. Now, moving on from the center screen, I also love the gauge cluster screen in cars equipped with MBUX because it is fantastic. It is a full screen, the same size as the one in the middle, and frankly, almost as configurable. You have three different sections and you can adjust each section to be basically whatever it is that you want to see. So you're not stuck with like a speedometer and a tachometer if you don't want those things. The speed is always displayed digitally in the center, but otherwise you can adjust it to show your fuel economy, your trip speed, your active driver assist systems, your map, you can do pretty much anything in any of these areas in the gauge cluster, which makes this so much more configurable than anyone else's cluster. And one cool thing, you can also go full screen with a lot of these different options. So for instance, if you want to see a full screen map, you can just tap a few buttons and you're there. And now the cluster is showing that full screen and you have the option to go full screen with various other items in this screen as well. So you can have it separated into thirds like a normal cluster or go full screen with whatever you want. It is just wonderfully configurable and it's right below your eyes, which makes it even better. You don't have to take your eyes very far off the road to see whatever you've set it to. And next up, a few other interesting quirks in the new E-Class. You have this little button here that says P with a camera. That has two functions. One, it activates the automated parallel parking system. So you press that and it will start looking for a parallel parking spot so that it can automatically park. You can also go from here to look through your various different car camera angles and you can see there are very very many of them, many, many of them. In fact, so you can see just about anything on the outside of this car. And the resolution is really fantastic, far better than rival systems, especially Audi, which is always lagged behind. This is great camera resolution. Now worth noting also that the button right next to the parking and camera button has a picture of a car with an arrow pointing up. That is your air suspension button. You press that and you can raise up the E-Class and make it a little taller. And that's important to mention for today's modern car buyers, because a lot of people do prefer sitting up a little higher. This car does give you the option. You press that button, you can raise it a little bit, give it more of an SUV experience. And let's talk about that SUV experience for a second, especially as it relates to this car, the station wagon version of the new E-Class. Mercedes has decided to follow the lead of Subaru with the Outback, Audi with the Allroad, and Volvo with its cross-country models, and they have ditched the standard E-Class wagon. Instead, they've SUV-ified it for the 21 model year. They've given it these fender flares that make it look more off-roady and muscular. They've raised it up a little bit with a little better ground clearance. They've made all-wheel drive standard, and they now call it the all terrain <laughs> designed to give it more of an SUV name. They figure that by doing these things, it'll make it feel a little more SUV ish and it might attract some more customers who would have otherwise bought SUVs and wouldn't consider a normal wagon until it's called the all terrain and it has these plastic fender flares. Now it is worth noting they are still going to make the AMG E63 wagon version of this car and it will not be all terrainified, but all of the regular E-Class wagons beginning with 21 are the all terrain version. There's no more standard E-Wagon. Now I have to say as someone who loves wagons and as someone who has owned two E-Wagons myself, <laughs> I don't really care, frankly. A lot of people are up in arms. Oh, they've made it SUV-ish. Not really. It hasn't changed much. Maybe it'll reach a broader demographic, but it's still a cool E-Class wagon. It drives and feels just like E-Class wagons before, and I don't think these changes like ruined it because they tried to make it SUV-ish. Frankly, I'm just happy they're still selling the wagon here, unlike BMW, who dropped the 5 Series wagon many years ago. But anyway, since I'm outside the E-Class, a few interesting exterior quirks. One is with the fuel door. You push it, and it pops open electric electronically. Every other car, you just push the fuel door and it pops open with like a mechanical latch. This thing, it's like an electronic lever that opens it up. Why do you have to complicate stuff like this? I love car technology. I'm really here for it. 
<laughs> but this just seems like overkill because you know it's gonna break. One other item I love in this vicinity, this plastic cladding around the wheels to make it look more SUV-ish. On the rear wheels, they had to stick a little cladding strip onto the rear door, which looks stupid. But the problem is in order to make it a circle, they had to go slightly onto the door. And so you were gonna end up with some weird situation here no matter what. Either it wouldn't be a circle and that would look dumb, or it would be and a small strip would have to be on the door. It just seems kind of funny that that had to happen. By the way, on the subject of the exterior of this car, probably the biggest change for 21, aside from the all-terrainified wagon, is the front end design, which has changed for all E-Class models, not just the wagon. They've updated it, and it looks different, a little bit more modern, a little bit more fresh, kind of keeping in line with some other new Mercedes-Benz models. So this will be an easy way to tell apart the 21 E-Class from earlier versions with sort of the older grille. But anyway, next up, moving on to the back seat of the new E-Class, and I have to say, not huge back here, but reasonably fine. The front seat is pretty far back, and I'm sitting here, my knees are kind of pushing against it, but it's not tremendously uncomfortable. Headroom is fine. This is a reasonable place for adults to be if they have to, but it's not a giant back seat like in a big SUV, but it'll do. Now, a couple of interesting items worth noting back here. One is the power outlet situation back here. You open up this little door, and you can see there's like a cigarette lighter style power outlet, but there's also this regular power plug back here, which is pretty cool to see. I'm always in the backseat of cars talking about how, oh, it has USB or it has USB-C or it has the cigarette lighter style. This thing, it just has the plug. You can decide how you want to charge your devices with this plug being back here. And that is a pretty neat feature to see. Another interesting quirk back here in the center seat, you can see there's a little nook for the seatbelt buckle. So if the seatbelt isn't in use, you can fold the buckle into this nook and then it won't get in the way. This will be especially helpful if you're trying to fold down the seats for a larger cargo area, then you don't have to worry about that buckle sort of keeping the seat a little higher up. Now also in the center here, you have this armrest that you can fold down. Nothing too surprising, although it does have two individual cup holders, one for each passenger, and a little storage nook as well. So it is a rather practical center armrest in back. And next up, we move around to the back of the new E-Class wagon, which is especially interesting because, as you can see, <laughs> there is a seat back here. There is a third row rear-facing seat standard in the latest E-Class wagon. They will all come with this <laughs> third row seat. Now, whenever I tell people about this, the first thing they say is, how can they do that? Isn't it dangerous? But the truth is, no, it's not. A lot of SUVs and minivans have third row seats in exactly the same place. They just happen to be facing forward instead of facing backwards, but it's no more dangerous than a forward-facing third row. You just have it looking back, which, if you were a child who grew up in the back of third row wagons, you know is a pretty fun little thing. And, in fact, this third row seat has one huge benefit over all the other third rows in the car industry, and that is access is tremendously easy because you don't have to fold the second row seat forward or move around it in some way. You can have whatever you want in the second row and climb into the third row using a completely separate door, which makes it really easy to get back here. Now, with that said, it isn't easy to get back here for everyone. <laughs> Allow me to demonstrate. I climb in back, and obviously that's easy to do, but the problem is there's really not any headroom at all. <laughs> I cannot put my head up any more than what you're seeing right now. And in fact, Mercedes-Benz says the maximum height for this third row seat to be comfortable is 115 centimeters, which is about four feet tall. So it really only is reserved for children, although frankly that's true of a lot of third row seats. I suppose you could do this and be slightly more comfortable. <laughs> although I still wouldn't recommend sitting back here as an adult. Now, it's worth noting, if you want an e-wagon and you don't really need the third row seat, that's okay. You can fold it so that it goes completely away, and frankly, you'd never even really know that it's there, but it is if you want. And putting a third row seat in the back of a station wagon poses some interesting challenges from a production and packaging standpoint. For instance, there are seat belts back here in the cargo area, which is kind of weird. You don't see that too often, but they're here on both sides so that when the third row's in place, obviously you can belt your passengers. And here's another one. How do people get out of the third row? Every other car seat has a door next to it. You just pull a handle. So what do you do back here? Well, there's this little button over to the side. You pull it and then the tailgate opens up. I presume that only works when the car is in park or turned off, but nonetheless, that button lets you get out just like it was a car door from your third row seat. And here's another interesting challenge. Below the floor back here, 
you have the battery. So how do you make sure that third row passengers, kids, aren't gonna like get in here and mess with the battery while you're driving? And the answer is the load floor locks. You can see it has this little lock. It's like a child-proof lock. And so you can lock it to make sure it's not lifted up when you have passengers sitting back here. Or if you need to access the battery, you just unlock it and then you can get in there and do that. And like I said, of course, you can get rid of the third row. You can kind of fold it completely away if you want more cargo room back here. And if you want even more cargo room still, you have little buttons over to the side in the cargo area that will lower the second row seat as well. You can pull these and the second row seat goes down and then you have more cargo space and you really have a lot of space in here with all of the seats completely folded. Obviously you can get rid of this bar which has the cargo cover on it and just have basically like a pickup truck in the back of your E-Class if you want to transport a lot of stuff. And by the way, speaking of that bar that contains the cargo cover, it also contains a dog net. You can see here you mount this to these little hooks on the ceiling of the car and then you have a net. So if you want to put your dog in the third row, you can separate it from the cargo compartment and the passenger compartment by using this net, which is a nice feature. A lot of station wagons used to have this but not too many do anymore which frankly is also true of the third row seat i think this might be the last car that offers a rear facing third row tesla had it for a while not sure if they still do but either way standard in the e-class for your children and so those are the quirks and features of the new 2021 mercedes e-class now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives all right driving the new e-class and i have to tell you there really is a lot to like about this car i already mentioned all the tech and these amazing tech features but it actually goes quite a bit further than that to the driving experience is fantastic. So this is the E450, and, and it's sort of the second engine, the grade. There's basically four here in North America. There's the 350, 450, and then two AMG models. This car has perfectly adequate power. It drives fantastically. This engine is great. It's like 360 horsepower. It is tremendously responsive. Um, this is all the power you'll ever need unless you really want the AMG version because it's just so cool. And this is just an impressive car. It also is very comfortable, tremendously quiet in here. The seats are comfortable. And so when you look at this car, you look at all the technology and you say, wow, this is you know, this pretty impressive stuff. Then you get in and you drive it and it also is pretty impressive stuff and it's just a great all around car. And that's kind of the thing that has always been true about the E-Class. I, I joke about how I've had three E-Classes. It's actually kind of embarrassing because nobody my age has had multiple E-Classes. They're just, they're old person cars, frankly. But they're also great. They're they're perfectly sized. They're not too big. They're not too small. Um, they're good cars. They got a lot of technology, a lot of equipment. They're, the AMG ones are nice and powerful. They feel good. They look good. They've always been sort of conservatively styled and, and reasonable cars. And there's just a lot of great things about them. And I really do think that this is the best E-Class yet. You get technology in here that outdoes an S-Class from just a few years ago, maybe five, six years ago. Um, you have a driving experience that is unbelievably supple just so luxurious and so nice. And the tech in here is great, including all the self-driving tech, just a really great system. Now, with that said, this stuff doesn't come cheap. This station wagon as equipped is probably, I would guess in the mid $80,000 range. Um, but a relatively well-equipped sedan is probably in the mid $70,000 range. That's a lot of money, but this is a lot of car. It really, it really does give you an enormous amount of car for the money, even at that price point. And this is all the tech that an S-Class would have. It just happens to be an E-Class. Now, one interesting thing about the E-Class wagon specifically, uh, Mercedes-Benz says that E-Class wagon buyers are some of their wealthiest customers. And I've often thought about why this is. And I think the main reason is there's no one on the planet who's like stretching to get an E-Wagon. Like there are people who like really stretch their budgets for a G-Wagon or a GLS because they're cool SUVs. But nobody's going in going like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sell everything I have to get an e wagon. And so the only people who are left are people who can just like supremely afford this car, um, because it's just not all that cool. And that's sort of a reality of the E Class. It has never been a very cool car, except for the AMG versions, of course. Um, but it's a good car, and it's just a great all-around car. And I really think this is one of the best all-around vehicles on the market today, in the sense that you have some of the best technology. You have a fantastically luxurious driving experience, but also a quick one. You have decent fuel economy. In the case of the wagon, you have a lot of storage space and you have the seat in the back. You can't go wrong with this car unless you're looking for something really cool or really standout or really performancey or really exciting. It's not that stuff. But if you just want a great luxury car, 
this is a great luxury car, and it always has been. And I think the updates for 21, frankly, make it even greater. And so that's the 2021 Mercedes-Benz E-Class. This is a fantastic car in a world that loves SUVs. And frankly, I think the heyday of the E-Class is probably behind us as consumers switch more to SUVs and electric cars. But if you are still looking for a great mid-size luxury car, Mercedes still makes one. And it got even better for 2021. Anyway, now it's time to give the new E-Class a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the E450 wagon is nice looking, not exactly gorgeous, but I do think wagons generally look very good, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Acceleration does 0 to 60 in under 5 seconds, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Handling is fine, good enough, but not sports car sharp, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Fun factor is okay, it's fast, it handles okay, but this car isn't exactly designed for thrills, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Cool factor is also okay, these are sort of cool in the sense of someone getting a wagon over yet another SUV, but they're still sort of dull family cars, and it gets a 4 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 25 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. This car is loaded, probably the best tech of any modern vehicle. I mean that sincerely. It only gets docked here because there's no electric component or plug-in version, and it gets a 9 out of 10. Comfort is excellent, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Quality is also excellent, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Practicality is great with three-row seating, although the third row is cramped, and overall cargo space just isn't as much as an SUV, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Finally, value, and this car has a lot of benefits. Benefits, but it's also very expensive. With the starting price of nearly $70,000, it gets a 5 out of 10 for a total daily score of 38 out of 50. Added up in the Doug score is 63 out of 100, which places it here against rival wagons and luxury SUVs. The E450 wagon is a great car. It's my favorite vehicle on this list, except for the AMG version, and it's even better with updates for 2021. It's a fantastic family car if you can afford it.